Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Echo Hawk Town Hall series. My name is Cindy. I use she, her pronouns, and we are here uh, in Ballard continuing our town hall series where we are visiting all of the different neighborhoods of Seattle. I'm very excited for this particular town hall. I myself live in Ballard, and so this is my home neighborhood. I'm really excited to see what sort of questions and conversations that we are going to be able to have with Colleen today regarding the concerns in our neighborhood. Uh, before we get started, I first want to welcome Matt. Uh, go ahead and unmute yourself, Matt, uh, and go ahead and open us up for a welcome. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Matt Echo Hawk Hayashi. So lucky, very, very lucky, actually, um, to be partnered with Colleen. Um, it's going to be 21 years in a month or so that we've been married and we've been together longer than that. Um, but really, I'm coming. Um, not just on my own behalf, but on behalf of a, our whole family that goes from Canada or in Canada, Alaska, the top of the world, all the way to um, Aotearoa and to Hawaii and to the East Coast. And for our whole family, um, thank you um, for not just being here, but for being the kind of people that on a Tuesday evening of a pandemic that you would spend your time um, thinking about and sharing about ideas that involve your community. And that is something that's not just um, we're grateful for, but something we admire very much. So we just wanna really extend a heartfelt um, gratitude and our aloha to all of you um, for joining us and um, for being open to hear what Colleen may have to say. Um, but more than that, just for being um, advocates and leaders in your community, we really appreciate you all. And on behalf of our family, we just want to welcome and thank you. Thank you, Matt, so much for welcoming us and opening us up with that. So uh, we are going to have a pretty standard town hall, very sort of straightforward agenda for this evening. We are first going to hear from Colleen. She'll say a few words, and then we will open it up to Q&A. When we get there, I'll let you know all the different ways that you can participate, all the ways that you can get your questions to Colleen. Um, and if you are watching us on Facebook or YouTube, don't worry. There are lots of ways that you can participate as well. Uh, Colleen, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and say a few words? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Cindy. And, uh, you know, tonight I'm just like feeling um, really grateful and um, overwhelmed by all of the support um, on this call are many, you know, volunteers and people who have just been so encouraging and, you know, pushing me forward in a way that really is so supportive. And I'm so grateful. Um, we also are just hearing support from all over the city. Um, my mom was at UW Medical Center um, today for a little procedure and she's doing great. So hi, mom. Um, but she was saying that the nurse there said, are you related to Colleen Echohawk? And she said, well, yeah, I am. And, and the uh, actually was a phys physician's assistant. And she said, well, you have 116 physician's assistant assistants supporting your daughter. And um, we're hearing those stories all the time. It just warms my heart. Uh, I I just am stepping into service. I truly am. And, and, and I, I want to serve this community. And so it just feels so amazing um, when we hear these kind of stories and see this kind of support. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart. And tonight, I just want to share with you a little bit more about who I am, what I'm thinking about for this city, um, why I believe so much in our beautiful, beautiful city and believe so much in Ballard. I was thinking about Ballard today. Ballard was one of the places where a lot of Native folks ended up um, living. Um, they don't, not so many live there anymore because of gentrification, but that was a place um, because of the fishing industry. So uh, it's, a, it's a place warm um, and dear to my heart. And I'm excited to be here and hear about the issues that are going on in Ballard and um, how, we can, um, how we can make this city an even better place. So thank you all for being here. And I know, um, you know, Matt mentioned this earlier, things have been hard. I just want to recognize that. I know that for me, it has been one of the hardest years ever for my family. I have worried about my kids, uh, my husband, my parents. I worried about Trump. Thank God we have a friend in the White House now. And, you know, when you're going through something hard, it can be hard to look towards the future. 
So it's really heartening to see all of you here figuring out how this city moves forward. It's so important and I'm so grateful for your time. Let me tell you a little bit about my background. I was born and raised in a little rural Alaska town called Delta Junction with seven siblings. My family ran a little motel and I grew up cleaning rooms and working the front desk. I come from a family of leaders, including my uncle, John Echo Hawk, who started the Native American Rights Fund over 50 years ago now. Um, my uncle, Larry Echo Hawk, was a Democratic Attorney, Attorney General of Idaho. And I'm most proud of my grandmother, Katie John, from the Copper River area in Metasta Lake. She fought a 30 year legal battle for subsistence, fishing and hunting rights all the way to the federal courts. And she won it in a landmark decision. She won it and she fought for it because she cared about her community and her family. And I share all of this with you because I want you to know that I come from a family that is no stranger to tough fights. I want to tell you why I'm stepping forward to run for mayor. I'm running because right now Seattle has some huge challenges. You all know it. You all feel it. But we also have the potential to turn this around and get it right. And while we confront many serious problems, such as police accountability, how we recover from COVID, and the urgency of climate change, I believe the crisis we have to immediately tackle is the homeless emergency. You know, the election this year will be on November 2nd. Six years ago to the day on November 2nd, 2015, the mayor and city council declared a state of emergency over homelessness. I can remember sitting on my couch watching King 5 and thinking, wow, this is going to be good. We're going to get something done. But it was like they pulled the fire alarm, but didn't send any fire trucks. There's been a ton of finger pointing and infighting, and the culture in City Hall has become toxic. And so sadly, we have more of our neighbors experiencing homelessness now than ever before. The status quo isn't working for anyone. It sure as heck, as heck isn't working for the three to 4,000 people 3,000 or 4,000 people tonight, because the numbers are not quite right, those folks are going to be sleeping outside tonight. That is a humanitarian crisis that has been, has allowed, that has been allowed to happen. It's not working, and we have to do more. Day one of an Echo Hawk administration starts with an emergency housing program. The goal is simple. We find a warm, dry, and safe place for everyone to sleep at night. That means an all of the above approach, more shelter space, hotel rooms, tiny houses, RVs, campgrounds, and other community-led solutions. No sweeps until there's a place to sleep. It makes zero sense to remove encampments until there's a warm and dry and safe place to move people to. I know from personal experience, if there's a better option, 98% of people experiencing homelessness will take it, but we have to figure out what that better option is for every individual. And as soon as we have a place for people to go, we end the practice of allowing people to camp in city parks and public right-of-ways. So how do we do it? <laughs> how do we succeed when there's been so much failure? First, we have to put the past behind us. No enemies, no grudges. We start fresh. We treat this like the emergency it is. After the election, I'll use the transition period to bring all parts of our community together. Government, business, higher ed, the philanthropic community, and residents. We all live in Seattle, in this beautiful, beautiful Coast Salish city, and we're in this together. The day I get sworn in, we'll hit the ground running with a plan. And this will be my top priority as mayor. I believe my life experience has uniquely prepared me to meet this moment in our city's history. Seven years ago, I became the head of Chief Seattle Club. We're a small nonprofit at the time um, that was there to serve urban native people who are experiencing homelessness. We feed people, we operate a day shelter and provide ways to reconnect with tribal culture, identity and spirituality. And in the last few years, we started to build housing. We've had some real successes. We're opening, opening 80 studio units this October, another 125 units next June, and another 80 units are in the pipeline. I worked with local governments to put surplus trailers on an unused parking lot in Soto. It's called Eagle Village. It's a huge success and it shows what can happen when we think creatively and we work together. I am so tired of the status quo. I know that there are good solutions out there. I know that you all have good solutions, but we are not heard. The bureaucracy is so heavy. 
with no willingness to try new things and new approaches. We know it's hard. I've been doing hard things every single day, and we've been incredibly successful at housing people. I can continue to grind out limited victories, or I can do something else hard, run for mayor, and take the strategies that we know that work to the city level and make generational change. I do this work because we can make a difference. I'm running for mayor because after seven years of doing homelessness work in the city, it's taught me that with the right leadership, we can make the difference on a much larger scale. You know, the first step in any transformational change is listening to people, talking to people, hearing their thoughts and ideas. And that's what we're doing in this campaign. I'm holding virtual town halls in 40 neighborhoods, Bitter Lake to Rainier Beach, from Lake City to Del Ridge, and tonight we're in Ballard. This is a time for change. This is a time for us to step forward. And when I was thinking about running for mayor, I called some of my elders, some important people that have known me my whole life, and I asked them what they thought. And one of them was my uncle, Fred John, and he told me, Colleen, there is no word in the Athabascan language for leader. In our language, the word for leader is servant because the leader is the person that serves everyone in the tribe. It's their job to make sure that the young people and the old people and the sick people are taken care of. I am running for office to be that servant, to be a new generation of leadership for my community. So I wanna thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for bringing your thoughts, your concerns, your ideas and your questions. I look forward to answering your questions and also want to invite you to have a dialogue. Let's talk about it. Let's let's um, solve some of these um, crises together tonight. Thank you for being here, and I look forward to a really great conversation. Thank you, Colleen, for those opening words. So we're going to transition to the Q and A portion of our evening tonight, and it's really straightforward. If you are in the Zoom call with us, just raise your hand. The way that you can do that is by at the bottom of your Zoom chat, there's a button that says reactions. Uh, when you click that button, one of the options should be to raise your hand. Please don't physically raise your hand. I can't necessarily see everyone all at once. Please do use the reaction button. You can also use the Zoom chat if you'd rather have your question asked that way. If you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, feel free to just put your question in the comments. We have folks looking there. All of those questions will get to Colleen. Um, and then if you are on Twitter, please feel free to use the hashtag Echohawk Town Hall, uh, and we will be able to see that as well. So to kick off our Q&A portion, I first want to bring up uh, someone who we are deeply gratitude, have deep gratitude for, or deep appreciation for. Uh, that is your neighborhood captain, uh, Lanny, who has been spreading the word about this Ballard Town Hall, uh, and doing a bunch of work to make sure that this town hall is uh, available for all folks in Ballard to attend. Uh, Lanny, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask her uh, first question, ask her first question of the evening? I do. Hello, Colleen, we're so happy to host you here in Ballard. Um, oh, uh, Lanny, as well, yeah. you're, if, you're, if you do not know your camera is off, it is off. There we go. <laughs> Hi, Lanny. Hi, thank you. Good to see you. And Colleen, I knew that I wanted you to be our mayor the first time I heard you speak. So I am so excited to host you here in Ballard. And my dream is that everybody that hears you tonight will walk away with the same feeling and we can all join forces and make sure you are elected. Oh, that's so, that's so kind. Thank you so much. It means a lot. How I feel about you. Um, I want to ask my question. I love, one of the things I love about you is that you are making housing or unhoused neighbors a priority. Mm -hmm. I also understand that that will take some time once you become mayor, but I'm thinking about the most vulnerable folks that are out there and I'm thinking about you'll be come mayor in the winter and the snow will be coming and what can we do to make sure that the most vulnerable get shelter first right mm -hmm. away? Will hotels be available? FEMA trailers, what's the plan for immediate <laughs> housing? Well, thank you so much for the question. And that's really um, one of the reasons that I'm running for mayor. As a service provider, the nights we have cold, cold weather and we have snow, it's hard to sleep. I mean, I this is community members that I know and love. And to think about them being out there in the cold and the snow. And a lot of the folks we serve, uh, Native folks, they don't 
want to go to traditional shelters. Um, and so it's just, it's really tragic and hard. And we know that every year we have um, folks who die of um, hypothermia on our streets. I think, let's just let that resonate, that, that in a city like Seattle, an incredibly prosperous city, we have people dying on our streets because they don't have housing. So we will get starting as soon as possible. I, I'll be honest, like, I'm up at night making notes on my phone, like going like, okay, here's how the plan's gonna work. And here's who, who's, here's, um, who's gonna do what and how we're gonna get going. Um, I think that um, we will use every kind of housing that we can that's out there. One of the things that has been incredibly successful is getting people into hotel rooms. Okay. I can tell you um, that we have people who've been experiencing chronic homelessness for over 20 years that are now in hotel rooms because of um, just really innovative work actually at the city and the county level. So um, this can be done. If you had told me, um, you know, 20 uh, or a year ago that we would have so many people in hotel rooms, I would be shocked. And that is why this is such an opportunity. We have to take um every opportunity and get this very vulnerable group inside. And to your answer about like the most vulnerable, um, because we know that, you know, people are, people are smart, people are surviving out there and, and we want to, and, and then there's some people that just really can't, um, you know, one of the realities about um, our homeless community is probably around one ish percent have severe brain damage and we are not serving them. They are suffering out there. They, they don't know where the services are. They're like, incredibly, um, they're just hurting. Um, so we would be creating a little army of um, outreach workers. Um, thankfully, I'm, I'm really familiar with all the outreach people that are out there. We will be prioritizing the dollars and, and getting that outreach, um, those outreach workers done. We also, I also want to do like a call to the community. You know, I know that they're through the pandemic, you know, there were like um, physical therapists who were, you know, all of a sudden phlebotomists and were taking blood. And there were, you know, people doing all kinds of different things in an emergency. And I hope that we can make the call out there and say, listen, if you have some, you know, background in mental health work and you have background in social work, let's find a way to get you trained so we all are have the same picture and idea and let's get out there. Because what I'm hearing from everyone around me is that people in Seattle are frustrated because we're a compassionate community and people want to do something. They want to be involved, they, but they don't know what it is. So as mayor, the other priority would be to prioritize communication to our community, the letting everyone know, like, you know, I've been trying to tell people all the time too, like this will take some time. Um, we will, we're looking at at least a year to get, you know, the 4,000 people that are experiencing you know, homelessness outside to inside. And then we have, you know, affordable housing we have to build and we have, you know, other, other uh, ways that we can get people into stability. So um, thank you so much for the question. As you can tell, I could talk for a very long time about it. I care so much about um, our relatives experiencing homelessness. And I also care about our neighborhoods. You know, it's it's really hard for a family when they want to be out there and play in a park or, you know, kick the soccer ball around. My daughter's really into soccer, so we're doing that all the time. Um, and and knowing that there's a tent right there, it just feels it feels sad. It doesn't feel good. It's not good for anyone. We can do so much better. So thank you so much for the question. And um, thank you for hosting tonight. Thank you, Lanny, and thank you, Colleen. Um, we have this comment uh, slash question from Facebook. It's a little bit long, uh, so I'm going to read it in its entirety. Um, and this is from Oshila Ray. Uh, we need affordable housing so that the houseless can get off the street and live with some dignity. This way we can all live in peace and harmony and not be afraid for our safety. We need better mental health outreach. We can't keep sweeping this under the rug. Not only is it unhealthy for people who have no homes, it's also depressing for members of the community who do have homes to have to see the unfortunate way our houseless neighborhoods, our neighbors are living. Every time I ride past one of these houseless camps in Ballard, I get low vibes and a feeling of helplessness because I don't know what all I can do to help without offending or overstepping. Homelessness should be our first priority and most important priority. And then Oshila also goes on to say, and hopefully this town meeting rings about change. Uh, I'm tired of just hearing our representatives and council members just talk to appease us. You can't put a Band-Aid on this. How many town halls of you officials just listening to us are y'all gonna have before actually making a move to change things for the better? 
Well, Sheila, you kind of, I, I, I think I answered some of um, what you're expressing and questions in the previous answer. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer the last part um, a little bit because I'm not elected yet. <laughs> and I um, know that there have been town halls and there have been outreaches to neighborhoods. And some of our elected officials, frankly, have not done the job. That's, part, that's a one of the biggest reasons I'm jumping into this race, I am. I, I agree with you. I'm so tired of there not being a plan of this continuing, you know, of a humanitarian crisis on our streets. It feels bad for everyone. I will tell you that our homeless community, they are not thriving in those tents. They want a better option, but we have not been able to provide that for them and find it for them. So um, this, this will be my top priority as mayor. I um, have seven years of working in this field, not only as a homeless service provider, um, so that means everything from food um, to mental health. Um, and then I also am a builder. You know, we are, I've been building housing now for the past three years. Um, we have some really good successes. We have a brand new building that's opening uh, in October and other ones that are out there. And so um, I understand what it will take to build the kind of housing that we need. And I do want to give everyone very clear expectations that it will take some time. It will take some time, but we have to have someone who has a vision for it, who has a vision for it, and someone um, like myself who can get in there and get it done. Uh, I think a predictor of success is having um, been successful, and I've been very successful in the past seven years, and know I can bring that same skill to the mayor's office. And finally, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for having compassion um, uh, to our homeless relatives. You know, you expressed it so beautifully. People feel um, sad about it and we don't know what to do because we haven't had the leadership. Um, I assure you that I will provide the leadership and we will get this job done. It is not, um, um, it's not too big. We can get it done. So thank you so much. Thank you, Colleen. Um, this is a question as well. Um, can you tell us about your experience working on police accountability efforts and what your goals would be as mayor? Oh, yeah, this is thank you for asking the question. Um, for the past um, four years, I have been a, um, a commissioner on the Seattle Community Police Commission. Um, I also have been the executive director of the Chief Seattle Club. And, you know, we support homeless native people. And when you're an advocate for some of the most disenfranchised, marginalized, and incredibly resilient people in our city, you deal with problems from the Seattle's police department on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and from those two vantage points, I can tell you that police reform has failed in Seattle. And we can't look away. We must have the courage to face that truth, to look at it in its eyes and, and take action. As mayor, I can tell you that my policy will be zero tolerance for bad cops, zero tolerance. I can't emphasize it enough, zero tolerance. You know, the mayor has control over two critically important responsibilities, the hiring of a new police chief and negotiating that police contract. And starting day one of an Echo Hawk administration, we will not tolerate officers with a history of biased policing, excessive force, or dishonesty. Honesty. Officers who violate those basic principles will be disciplined and removed from any, any duties where they interact with the public. And I feel so strongly on this because I have actually experienced this myself where I have seen brutality happen to um, an individual experiencing homelessness. And I have seen them be treated so incredibly poorly and with disrespect. And I have reported it to the Office of Police Accountability and nothing has happened. And we know that throughout the summer, there was ongoing, um, ongoing, um, it seemed like the, it seemed like people like it was out of control, you know? And so we, we absolutely have, um, a responsibility to do better. So, um, we, we know that the, um, Seattle police guild is also um, a big problem. Um, keep in mind that we have, um, six officers who have, um, gone to the insurrection, and um, the police guild is protecting them. Um, and we have to do, we have to do something there. Um, the police guild has shown so far little interest in accepting reforms. The 2018 police contract rolled back many of the reforms we put in place. As a community police commissioner, um, I worked very hard to, um, I went to the mayor's office, I talked to council along with my other commissioners to, 
to say that this was not a good contract. Our um, community police commission, we voted to reject it. Um, and we just, we have um, a police guild that is incredibly strong right now and are not being held accountable. Um, my administration will also strengthen the role of civilians in our accountability system to ensure fair and just review of the actions of police officers. I already shared with you about how um, I have seen it personally fail. We will go back to neighborhood focused public safety that prioritizes healing, and well-being over conflict and punishment when it comes to situations of mental health and addiction by sending actual mental health providers and not armed officers. I also will be looking towards community-led solutions. Um, there is a tremendous wisdom about public safety in our community that we will that we will look at and we will hear and we will implement. So this is um, this is a time for decisive and clear leadership. This is a, our, we've been saying in our campaign for you know weeks and weeks now. This is a time for a new generation of leadership, um, someone who will actually um, take it head on, and and will not be afraid and have the courage to change. So thank you so much for the question. Um, as you can tell, it's something I feel very passionately about. And look, um, and, and, and I'm so excited about the opportunity um, to lead our city into true police accountability. Thank you, Colleen. Um, these two questions are very similar to each other, so I'm going to read them uh, back to back. Okay. Uh, one is from our Zoom chat from Sonia. Uh, this is what Sonia is asking. I'd love to hear Colleen's thoughts on lifting our apartment ban citywide, aka the single family zoning structures to allow for broader densification, reducing the obstacles of neighborhood design reviews and environmental impact reviews to enable faster densification. And this is from Lisa Price on Facebook. What are your thoughts on rezoning developers and protection of neighborhoods? Yeah, well, thank you so much. And I think it is a really complex um, situation that we find ourselves in. Um, I know, I know, I know, I know that this is a city that is um, passionate about our, our, our is passionate about climate change and, and our responsibility to it. And um, we're passionate about neighborhoods. We're passionate about um, each other. And so we're in a, an interesting, um, in an interesting place. Um, where we need to have, again, um, leadership. And I will say that I would like to see the changes and would implement uh, or would encourage the changes. So it wouldn't just be me. I'd have to be working with neighborhoods and city councils um, to um, change the single family zoning structures. We have to um, find ways to um, um, in encourage um, greater density, um, you know, the opportunity to create wonderful community and new buildings um, is, is something I'm really excited about. I love um, the idea of, of building community and bringing community together. But I want to give the lens on, um, I want to say that the lens has to be done in, with equity and racial justice. We know that some affordable housing that has been built, um, and um, I've been very involved in this, has encouraged gentrification. Um, we have to be thinking about preference policies where we um, encourage, um, if you have lived in that neighborhood before, um, that we would give you community preference to come back and live in that affordable housing. Um, we have to be uh, giving, uh, giving um, leadership and giving resources and giving land to um, black and indigenous and people of color led organizations. Um, we know that there has, um, that we have a very, very significant problem of um, over-representation over of people of color in our homeless community um, and, and lack of um, resources to actually be buying homes. So we have um, an interesting um, um, time ahead of us. I think that we can do both that we can um, be neighborhood focused, and we also can be focused on equity and racial justice in the way that we build um, out affordable housing and we build out um, new housing um, that is, is gonna change some of the zoning laws. And I know it'll be hard, but it's not too hard. It's something that we can do together as community. And I would be looking for the guidance from um, community. Um, I'm not the kind of person that's gonna just say, this is the way it's gonna be done. And then it can't happen that way either, right? There's a lot of, of um, intricacy around how we would change those zoning laws and a lot of people that will be involved. Um, but it's something that I care about tremendously because um, it is time for change and it's time for that we have equity and racial justice in our city. Thank you, Colleen. Um, 
I just wanted to let you know that Fred John sends his regards and his love hmm. and wants to let you know that you, his, your family from Alaska is watching. Aww. Hi, Uncle Fred. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. uh, this is a question again from Sheila. How hmm. would you handle protests that get out of hand? Yeah, that is a, again, another interesting question and a hard one. Thank you so much. You know, we have a a really amazing history in our country of peaceful protest. We have protests that have um, changed the world. And so I absolutely believe that we have um, a wonderful community um, who over the summer said, we believe that Black Lives Matter. We believe that police should be held accountable. And and we're going to be out there in the streets in the middle of a pandemic, letting the whole world know that um, that, that, that these lives and these people really matter. And again, I think that Seattle is just one of those places where we um, are, we care so much and we, and we take action. I think that there was incredible amount of um, policing that was done ineffectively and was done um, in, in ways that um, caused further harm and, and, and escalated things in, in that got out of hand. Um, I work again in you know, homeless services. One of the, the first things we do when you become um, a staff member is you take de-escalization training. Um, and you and you learn how to to use those skills. And I think that we have a lot to learn there. Um, we have again accountability to our police, um, um, to our police uh, and our chief of police. It's incredibly important. And then you know for the folks that are out there who are you know getting violent, who were breaking into stores. Um, that is not acceptable either. Like we have to find ways to show our protest, to to give voice to what has gone wrong, and 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 be loud and be um, and make those changes. But I believe that we can do it in a way where there's not any violence, um, where um, there is um, greater protection for our businesses who were who were really hurt through that um, through that time. Um, and I will tell you that you know um, I did not go down in um, March. And during um, the George Floyd protest um, is because I was working um, in essential services and I did not want to get COVID. But as mayor, I would prioritize it. I would be down there. If something like that happened again with, with um, the terrible, terrible murder of George Floyd and, and the people in the, in, the, in the city were rising up and saying, we have to change, I would agree with them. And I would be down there and I would join that protest as well. Thank you, Colleen. Um, how is your relationship with Governor Inslee? Huh. Well, I don't really know Governor Inslee that well, but I would I would like to. Um, I think that um, well, one quick story. One time, my my sis, my siblings and I were giving a talk, and Governor Inslee inter- introduced us, and he called us. Um, um, he, he compared us to Serena and Venus Williams, which was super funny for us because we're very unathletic. Um, but uh, I look forward to um, getting to know Governor Inslee better. Um, I think that we are very aligned in some of our values. Um, today, he was um, um, very vocal about um, um, the state law that he, he signed into. Um, he signed on to it around um taking um, native mascots um, out of Seattle or Washington public schools. And I think that's incredibly important. I'm very excited to get to know him better and um, work alongside um, him and his and his team, um, especially around infrastructure here in Seattle. Thank you, Colleen. Oh. Uh, this is a little bit of a longer uh, a statement, uh, feedback, I believe less so than a question. Um, And this is from Alec Viam. I feel like there can be many opportunities to live in this town affordably Mm -hmm. from more homeowners leasing a vacant bedroom to a permitting process for mobile homes to be in more areas of private property with people living in them and sharing a kitchen and bathroom like what Portland is currently suggesting or new building for denser housing. I feel like the organization and payment systems for public parking could improve to make this easier. And then um, here are some other notes. Revisit parking benefit districts as recommended by HALA. Expand Mm -hmm. RPZs and paid parking. 
um, establish new RPZs before parking gets tight, eliminate the vehicle license subsidy, make RPZ permit applications at a reduced or no cost to, uh, to those with low incomes that need a car, allow, sorry, make the limit of the number of permits clear in public, mm -hmm. allow leasing and transfers of permits by permit holders, establish a directory of permit leasers by their location so nearby business can advertise them. The 2016 carbon tax passed in King County by 27,000 votes. Municipal transportation expenses could be paid more by these parking fees and less by those who don't need a car. Uh, more low-income residents without kids could be eligible for an earned income tax credit supplement from the revenue that used to go to transportation. And uh, finally, the state or county could create a liability insurance program when private parking leases become competitive with public parking rates. So more owners would lease parking. Wow. I will admit that I don't know much about that parking um, fee system. It sounds super interesting. I'd love to talk to you about it offline um, and learn more about it. And we'll do a little research on our side on the campaign team. Um, you know, but I, and I also just, I just want to say in general, I love the innovative nature of everything you're saying. One of the things that will be very, very clear about an Equihawk administration is tearing down gatekeeping, you know, and hearing from community. What what are these ideas that are out there? How can we implement them? And, and, and what, what is possible, right? I just think there's so much out there that I look forward to hearing from in community. Um, and then to the housing piece, I could not agree more. You know, one of the things that um, always sort of, it, it kind of bugs me about affordable housing. I've been very, very involved in affordable housing for a while now is it's all the same stuff. It's all the same people. It looks, you know, the same ideas. Um, and, you know, and now we have permanent supportive housing. So that's, that's a great innovation, very important. But before there was, you know, any settlers in this area, um, there were longhouses. And these longhouses were a little bit like what you described. They were a place for community to live. There were, um, you know, facilities there. And they um, are, you know, an, an interesting idea. You know, why couldn't we make a coast, why can't we build a Coast Salish longhouse with permission from the tribes? <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, create like SROs in them, right? Like give everyone their own little room, a really beautiful shared bathroom, like a really great one so that people can feel comfortable and excited about it. And then shared um, other shared resources. I think we have to absolutely innovate in that way as soon as possible. Um, again, with the mobile parks um, for mobile homes, absolutely. We'll be looking at every single one of those possibilities and getting moving on it as soon as we can. Um, the the housing world um, has been dominated by the same people and the same ideas for a long time. So I will be looking for those kinds of innovations, looking for Black and Indigenous and people of color-led innovations that, um, that you know, honor um, our cultural um, understandings of housing. Those are important. So let's think with the, about what they are and let's make some really positive changes. Yes, thank you so much, Alec. And just a reminder for folks, um, if you have thoughts, uh, please feel free to email them. Our email is info at echohawkforseattle.com. Uh, we look at that uh, email box every day. And so um, comments like the one that you put, Alec, obviously we will be saving that information for ourselves, but please feel free to send that onward as well. Um, uh, this is a question from Lila uh, in the Zoom call. Um, I would like to know how Colleen has interacted with our current mental health system in her work and any ideas on how she might work to reform or redesign the system to go hand in hand with efforts to help our houseless neighbors. Oh, you know, our mental health system here in Seattle is really lacking. We have, um, we have to do better. We have to do more. Um, my agency, the Chief Seattle Club, we um, work with some mental health providers. We provide our own mental health, including traditional spirituality. Um, mental health work has, um, has been a really important part of, of how we um, make sure that we're, we're meeting people right where they're at as, as Native community. Um, and I think that that's a really big part of, of what we need to do in the future. Um, we need to be working with mental health providers that um, represent many different kinds of cultural communities and the LGBTQ plus community, especially. Um, that one, that, that's a community that gets, um, is vastly underserved in our homeless 
uh, provider system. So uh, that's something that's on top of mind for me. Um, and, and I think that the, we, we can, we, we have to reinvent the mental health space. That's what we have to do. Um, we don't have enough money coming in um, from Washington, um, from, from the state government. And so there will be um, uh, many tiers and, and understandings of how we work to make sure we have a mental health system that works for, for Seattle. Um, that'll be working with the state legislature, um, working on the ground with um, some of the providers, people that are already doing the work and doing, and doing some great work and expanding that work um, as well as, as, as seeing of other innovation. Um, we need ambassadors on, on the streets of Seattle who are offering, you know, that emergency mental health um, um, to our community. You know, during the pandemic, um, with the heart of the pandemic, the, hard, the really hard times, I was working um, a couple, you know, at least one day a week or sometimes two or three days a week down at our day center. And there was this one day um, where they were waiting for me to open up the doors. So, um, cause we open up at seven o'clock or seven in the morning. Um, there was this lady um, right in the heart of downtown and she was in so much agony and pain. She was just screaming and just, just hurting so badly. And I think about her often because I had nothing I could do. There was no one to call. I knew that I knew that 911 wasn't going to help her. Um, there was no one to to just check in with her and be like, how's it going? No one that knows her. That's the other thing about some of our mental health work that has to happen is building those strong relationships. Um, and, and it was just this feeling of helplessness. So we have to do better. Um, I look forward to working with community to think about um, ways that we can support mental health um, and and create um, this beautiful community that supports our folks who are you know struggling with their mental health and and who are really truly suffering um, that's let's be clear about that there are some folks in on the streets of Seattle right now who are suffering and we have to do better for them thank you so much oh thank you Lila uh, Lila I appreciate the thumbs up I'm like tired tonight I had to take I had to take our dog at like six forty or six thirty this morning to get her um, spayed, and it's just been a long day ever since. So I, I like the thumbs up. I like needed the encouragement. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, we are speaking of long days. We are kind of coming towards the end of our town hall. So if you have a question, please um, ask, ask it now. We will try to answer as many as we can. Uh, we may not be able to answer all of them though. This is from Sean Middleton. Uh, so thankful for all you have accomplished for the Seattle community. We have talked about one of the best tools on healing uh, is trauma-informed prevention in the school and foster care system. Mm -hmm. As mayor, is that something you would have influence over? Being mayor is such a big job. I know your style of leadership will bring positive change. Don't forget to practice self-care during such a difficult job. Your role modeling and leadership is needed. Oh, Sean is an old friend. Hi, Sean. He doesn't live in Seattle anymore, but I'm glad you're glad you're tuning in tonight. Yeah, I think absolutely, you know, trauma informed care has been something that has really um, been a high priority for me in my work. Absolutely huge, important part of successful work with our homeless community. I would love to see it in schools and other areas around or other, I think it was schools. And what was the other part, Cindy? Schools and some of uh, uh, foster care. Oh, foster care. Oh yeah. I, I mean, 100%. Just so everyone here knows is that foster, foster care um, is, is if you are in foster care, you will have a much higher rate of falling into homelessness. Um, foster care is, is just one of those things that uh, we, we could use a lot of reform on. Sadly, as mayor, I couldn't do that much. Um, the education, Seattle Public Schools has their own governance structure, but I would look forward to partnering with the Seattle School Board um, to be talking about ways that we can um, support our, um, our kids out there who are struggling and, and, and experiencing just a ton of trauma. And, and I think all of you probably will agree with me that this past year has been just full of trauma. I, I don't know about you, but I 
there were times and I'm like, what is happening? The worry is so severe. Um, the fear for your own health, um, the anxiety. I know that, um, I'm fully vaccinated now. And when I went to the grocery store, I realized, well, I'm not, I'm not like really anxious. <laughs> when I would go to the grocery store during the pandemic, my heart would be racing. I'd just be like, oh my gosh, it's, it is, you just feel like you're putting yourself at risk and you might be putting someone else at risk if you have COVID and you don't know it. And there was just all these dynamics. And so I think our whole of the whole world, our country, this city, we all need to be trauma informed right now. We all need to be taking a, a deep breath. We all need to be working on our, our own healing and, and supporting each other. And um, that is what I hope to bring to our city as well, is that lens. Um, I think part of the way we do that is by, um, you know, resourcing our communities, resourcing our neighborhoods um, to be taking care of each other. So thank you so much, Sean, for the question. Good to hear your name pop up. Okay. I don't believe we have any remaining questions. I will give it a moment just in case something pops up. Um, but, you know, Colleen, do you want to say a couple of words while we wrap up tonight? Sure. Well, thank you so much, um, everyone who's on this call. Um, I continue just to be like blown away by the incredible support. We have over 250 volunteers. We have volunteers who are on this call right now um, who are helping with this meeting, who have donated hundreds of hours. Like it's just, it just... I can't, I have no words. I'm so grateful. And I want to invite you to be part of this campaign. I, I really believe that this is about a movement. This is about saying what has been the status quo was not working already pre-pandemic. After this pandemic, we have to do better. We have opportunity that we've never had. Um, and this is the time for that new generation of leadership. I hope that you feel really um, cared by me right now. That's a part of the way that I wanna live in this world. I hope that you all know how significant you are, how important you are, that every day um, this world needs you and needs your voice, needs your perspective, needs your ideas and needs your um, love your, um, as Matt said earlier, aloha. So thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you at future town halls. And yeah, thanks. Especially big thanks to Cindy, the incredible hostess. Thank you, Colleen. Well, speaking of future town halls, our next town hall is going to be this Thursday. It's going to be for Lake City. So if you are in Lake City or know someone who lives in Lake City, please let them know that we will be in their virtual space come Thursday. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. If you uh, want to reach out to the Echo Hawk campaign, please check out our website, echohawkforseattle.com, or you can email us directly at info.echohawk.com. Um, I think that is it for tonight. Good, have a good evening, everyone. Um, and please um, let us know if you have any more questions or feedback.